It's 1971, and a um, college senior, me, uh, at the time I had a full head of hair, quite a bushy <laughs> afro as a matter of fact, and a beard. And I'm trying to decide what's the next step in life for me. I'd come to college and had gone through the requisite changes in uh, concentrations and majors. Gone through the requisite uh, crises of faith, wondering if this thing that my parents had passed on to me really could stand the test of time. Did it really fit me? Did it mean anything in a context where colonialism is falling, segregation is being challenged, structures are being upended? And to my amazement, Jesus really did make sense. And now I've got to figure out what I'm going to do with my life. And so I went to the wisest person in many respects at that stage, and the person I felt really could help me discern that, it was my pastor's wife. And we're sitting in the kitchen trying to decide, what do I do? Do I do a good job? Do I take some time off? Do I travel, perhaps? Do I pursue some of the things in the arts that I'm interested? Um, or do I go after medicine, which is what I came to college for originally? And she utters a word that really is transformative for me, a few words. And she says to me, I want you to remember that it's really not a career in medicine. It's a call to a ministry of healing. If you'll keep that straight, you'll be OK. And she was absolutely right. Her response was not so much a counsel as it was to set a context, to remind me that as a follower of Jesus, in the world of work, I had to be driven not by the notion of career, but by the notion of calling. And that my life's work would be to figure out that calling and to apply it and be faithful to it and exercise it. I think that that's really at the nexus of putting faith and work together. I think we need to get away from career. I don't like the word anyway. If you follow it and its origin from old French and so on, it's about racing, racing, running around in circles at top speed, sometimes going nowhere. And that seems to be often what career really is about. Calling, though, has some other components to it. And I'm not talking about the eerie, sort of mystical things. I mean the notion that the Lord has put me someplace and the Lord has a purpose for my being there. There's something I bring there. There's something that God has put in me that's supposed to be used in that place, in that setting, in that context. I'm called to be there. I love that poet that declared that uh, that gift of time is so important. If only just a minute, only 60 seconds in it. I really got to use my time because I'm called. Now, at the same time, uh, once I understand that I'm called, as I enter into that workplace, I really have to begin to decide how I really exercise that calling. And how do I become used as an instrument of God? I think one of the things that's key is that we have to be convinced that we really do have something to share. Jesus was convinced and convicted about that, and he declares in Matthew, the fifth chapter, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and then put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everybody in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they can see your good deeds and glorify your fathers in heaven. And this really does presume that people are out there looking for light. And I discovered that that turns out to be true. I found that in co-workers, as a resident in the hospitals, <coughs> who are often struggling with issues of meaning in life and trying to figure out how to balance all of the competing demands on their time, including family and friendship and justice in the world, I found that people really were looking for light, patience, who wanted the person who was just about to cut them open to at least pray with them. They wanted to be sure that perhaps you had some guidance that went perhaps even beyond your training in medicine. <laughs> I found it very much in uh, judges later on as I began to work both in medicine and then later as a pastor, who sat me down in their chambers and once said to me something that was really profound. He says, I'm very clear about what it is that I can and can't do. I can restrain people but I don't change people. If you do what you've been called to do, that's your job. This gospel really does transform people. So we have to have a conviction that, in fact, we've got something to share and something to give the world. 
And I think that Bill Peel and Walter Larimore are absolutely right. We have to earn the right to be heard. And I think it's really true. Our lives always come before our lips. One of our great tragedies sometimes in the Christian faith is we so undo the words we speak with the actions that we perform. If indeed we're going to be serious about earning that right to be heard, I think we have to bring to our work a tremendous excellence. We should never be found in the position of that applicant for the job who uh, has their references being checked. And as they call the person with whom they'd formerly worked, they said, how long did this person work for you? He said, about four hours. <laughs> <laughs> Which point the officer to class, I'm absolutely astonished. He told us he'd been there a long time. Yeah, he's been here for two years, but as far as I can tell, he's worked for us <laughs> four hours. <laughs> right? Or perhaps worse yet, you know, the, 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 the Christian who runs to the boss, somebody else has been promoted over them, and they argue, uh, this is terrible, it's awful, it's unfair. I've worked here for 10 years. I've got the experience. I've got the seniority. And the boss puts his arm around Bill and says, Bill, I like you, Bill. Problem is, you really have a 10 years experience. You've got one year's experience 10 times. I don't have to be a rock star in my job setting, but I've got to be competent. And I've got to show the evidence that I'm committed to this organization, committed to its mission and purpose. And if I'm not, probably shouldn't be there. I've got to demonstrate excellence. The word says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, so whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And that glory ought to be evident in what I do. Not only have to be uh, excellent, but I've also got to be a person of integrity. I love Psalm 15, and I won't go through all of the different uh, aspects of that, but it's pretty amazing when it talks about those who will live on God's holy hill and those who will walk uprightly and those who will have a reputation, worth reviewing. Because what becomes clear again is that if I walk with integrity, that in and of itself becomes a profound witness. And the challenge that we often give is not only to the individual, but I think the institution, the church itself, has to begin to ask if it needs to walk with greater integrity, particularly in the areas perhaps of financial stewardship. One of the things we learned early on was that if we were really serious, we had to be transparent financially as an organization. We had to have audits absolutely every year. That we couldn't stand up and ask the business world or the public sector to be accountable if, in fact, we were not ourselves. And lastly, but I think we have to give our show demonst or demonstrate a real concern for others. Uh, we have to demonstrate that uh, people are not just notches on our evangelism belt, but that we really care about them deeply, <clears throat> their relationships, their families, their hurts, their needs, their concerns, their issues. Uh, we've got to demonstrate that we are generous, not just fair, but really generous people. Come to believe that, in fact, once we earn that right, we can really speak up for Jesus and we can speak out for justice. We can do powerful, exciting, interesting things. We can become honest brokers in situations where very often there really are not very many. And if we can bring to this work a sense of our calling, I can stop thinking about myself as a doctor and more as a minister of healing. Stop thinking about myself as a lawyer and perhaps more as a minister of justice. I can stop thinking about myself as a businessman and understand better my ministry of stewardship or stop seeing myself as an administrator and come to appreciate who I am as a minister of helps. If I can understand my calling and then walk in that. This gospel really works. And it doesn't just work for Harvard graduates who are going to medicine. Worked for a young man by the name of who I call David. Phenomenal drug dealer, incredible leader, quiet but powerfully charismatic. We had a whole crew of young men really following after him who reached this crisis in juvenile detention. 
as he realized two things. He had just lost his best friend, shot in the head in front of him on Blue Hill Avenue in Boston. And he'd had a baby daughter born and didn't have a clue about what it meant to be a father for that child. That crisis led him to ask if perhaps even the faith of his preacher father, but more importantly, of some of the men from a church who were coming to visit him might actually work. And he discovered that it did. That faith could impel him to go back and finish to the, college, the high school education he hadn't completed. That faith could carry him through the University of Massachusetts to get his BA, the first in his family to ever do it. That faith could give him strength, not only to become the director of a program where, in fact, he would do in the lives of young people what was being done in his own life. But that faith could make him an entrepreneur in his community. Let him take all of that that he had learned being an effective drug dealer and make himself a renovator of homes and a provider of, of, of homes and a reducer of blight in urban neighborhoods. That same faith could help him become somebody who would go to the auctions and help people who needed transportation find cars so that they could work and earn. This faith works. But it requires people who move beyond career and determine that they will walk in their calling. Thank you. Thank you so much. I love that you've challenged us to think, for people who are not in pastoral ministry, to think not in terms of career, but in terms of their calling to ministry. But you've also spoken about the calling of the pastor, how the, the judge said, I can restrain people, but you can really help people achieve transformation. So I wanted to know, how would you relate the calling of a pastor to the calling of other persons to ministry? How do those, uh, how do those relate to each other? Well... We wrestle with this all the time, certainly in our congregation, but I really believe that the work of ministry is really the work of the congregation. We kind of get it flipped, a little backward here. Um, I think Ephesians 4 is right. We are really called as pastors and teachers and uh, those who may have ordained positions to equip the folks who are going where the gospel needs to be carried. I mean, I like having the gospel in the four walls of the church, but where I really need it is on the street corner. Where I really need it is in a boardroom. Where I really need it is on the shop floor. That's where I need the gospel. And that's where the gospel does its greatest and most powerful work. So my job is just to help the people who are there do their calling more effectively.